participate with you today talking about the Department of Peace. Uh, my invitation says that we're to talk about uh, its potential contribution to Canada and beyond, and to talk about some of the challenges uh, of the bill itself, Bill uh, C-373, which Alex Adamanenko has put forward. Uh, I've been cast in the role of a media representative here. Uh, as you heard, my background is in journalism where I worked for many years, but it's been some years since I've been in the newsroom, uh, even though I do continue to write my blog called The Pulpit and Politics, and uh, I write books as well. Um, uh, also, you uh, heard that I'm with the Canadian Labour Congress. I work in a communications capacity, which I have done for some large organizations. I should also point out that I'm not speaking for the Canadian Labour Congress here today, but only for myself. But I do want to take a look at this from a communications perspective, uh, not to talk so much about what journalists and media organizations are or are not doing uh, on behalf of peace. Uh, there would be a lot to talk about there, and I'll mention a little bit about it. But really, I'm more interested in talking about um, how we can look at this uh, initiative as a communications challenge and look at what are the challenges and really what are, are some of the opportunities. Uh, a word on challenges, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on that. Those who heard uh, Ian Mackay last night heard a lot about the challenges. Uh, he talks uh, uh, in his book, along with Jamie Swift, about the warrior nation and how people are trying to recast us as that rather than a peaceful nation or peacekeeping nation. Uh, and that includes uh, uh, the highest echelons of our government, it includes the Defense Department, it includes think tanks, certain academics, and yes, certain media. So it seems like quite an array of people who are, uh, who are opposed to uh, some of the things that we consider very important. So that's a challenge. Uh, I just want to briefly mention one other challenge uh, uh, and uh, Alex or Paul would know more about this than I do. But this is a private member's bill which Alex is bringing forward. Private member's bills are very important, but they usually do not become law. So people putting this forward, I think, probably know that the chances of this bill actually becoming law, particularly with this government, are minimal. So what you're doing is you're building uh, momentum and building a movement towards something longer term. Uh, perhaps uh, really what has to happen is governments have to put forward uh, legislative changes. And obviously to create a department, you will have to have legislative change. Uh, that will have to be done by a government, probably likely than a private member, and perhaps it can be done by a future government. Uh, I want to talk a bit about opportunities. Uh, I wrote a biography of Alan Blakeney when uh, he had uh, just retired as being the Premier of Saskatchewan. And Alan always uh, would say to his, uh, his MLAs, and he would tell other uh, governments after he was out of power, uh, you have to have a big idea. People should be talking about your idea rather than about their idea, which might be a small idea. It's okay if they attack you because they're talking about your idea and it becomes uh, center stage. Let's look at a couple of uh, big ideas which were way off on the, on the sidelines and moved into the center of Canadian life. At the turn of the century after 1900, women didn't vote in Canada. Uh, people like Nellie McClung and a whole group of others changed that. They did that by building a movement, by working very intelligently, by being incredibly persistent. Now, when we think about it, the fact that women wouldn't vote seems to be off the planet Mars. But just a little over 100 years ago, or 800 years ago, it was a big issue and it looked like they probably would never get anywhere. Uh, Medicare or public health care would be another example. There were people working on that, uh, I've researched it, there were people working on that in rural municipalities in Saskatchewan in 1916, and probably in, in the, all kinds of other places that I don't know about. It took until 1962 when it became a reality, a legislative reality in Saskatchewan, and 1966, 68 got picked up for all of Canada. But I'm sure the people who were working on that issue over all those decades wondered sometimes whether it would ever come to pass. So certain things which seem impossible become possible because of work put into them and because of changing situations uh, that are maybe beyond uh, the capacity of the people who are working on those issues but take advantage of them when the time comes. So these were ideas whose time had come, but the time would not have come if people hadn't worked on them. That's how I look at the Department of Peace as a big idea. Your idea is that peace and peacemaking are, are very important and your way of trying to put that into practice is to create the Department of Peace. 
Let me just talk about a couple of the advantages that I see us having, see you having in this issue. Uh, peace building and peacemaking is not a dirty word in Canada. In fact, uh, there's a constituency for it and there has been for a long time. Uh, Quebec. Quebec is very important in all of this. Quebec is why we didn't go to Iraq. Quebec uh, was why there was a lot of agitation about uh, conscription. Uh, Quebec has to be, or some organizations in Quebec, really have to be on side in this, and I hope that you're working on that. Political parties and political culture. Uh, in Canada, uh, last night you had the NDP, the Greens, and the Liberals at your meeting. Uh, I don't know how many of you watched the debates in the American election campaign, but I watched the last one. When they asked the question about gun control, both of the candidates ran for the hills. When they asked the question about Iran, they both talked tough and wanted to be tougher than the other. It's a different political culture. We have a very valuable and treasured political culture here where there is room for this sort of debate. Academ uh, academics and think tanks. We've heard how there are people on the other side of the issue, on the side of the warrior nation, but there are also a lot of other people, like your spe uh, speaker last night, who are available to you in terms of creating and uh, discussing ideas. Ideas do matter. Before any important political change takes place, there are ideas out there that other people who maybe didn't think them up grab them and run with them. So ideas are really important. The support of faith communities. I won't go into it, but there are the whole Anabaptist communities, the United Church, the Catholics, if you can get the bishops on side, get them going. Uh, remember Pope Paul II, John Paul II opposed the Iraq War again and again on the basis of, of the just war theory, which comes out of their theology. So there is something uh, that's possible among the largest group of uh, religious adherents in Canada. Uh, I think of other NGOs and religiously based organizations. Uh, the, I just gave my check that we did to the Christian peacemakers. Uh, they are doing, in a sense, what you were talking about doing with the, uh, with the peace professionals. And we've heard uh, from Dave uh, some other uh, ideas about and, and realities about what young people are doing. And finally, the tradition of volunteerism. Uh, I belong to a, a group of people who go to the opera, and most of my fellow uh, opera goers are people who, whose life uh, view was formed being CUSO cooperatives many years ago. Uh, we have Katimovic, we have the Company of Canadians, we have Frontier College, uh, not to mention the, the religiously based groups I've talked about. There is a tradition of that kind of uh, activity in Canada which would line up very well with the, uh, with the uh, a peace professionals group that you have in mind. Uh, I probably am running out of time, but I just want to end on this uh, on, the, on two notes. One is, um, remember the very recent uh, scandal of tainted beef? Uh, there's a good argument for another department here rather than just the Department of Defense, but the Department of Peace. In that case, the Department of Agriculture and its minister simply refused to protect consumers and the health of Canadians because they see their role as, as promoting agribusiness. Well, the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency should be reporting to the Department of Health, not the Department of Agriculture. So when someone says, we've got it covered off with the Department of Defense, no, they don't. You have to have a Department of Peace. Finally, I want to mention that people like you and probably people like me are often, uh, are often described as woolly-headed idealists and you can't really let them run anything. Uh, I did in uh, my blog talk to uh, Douglas Roach, Senator Douglas Roach, when he uh, did a book tour a few years ago, and uh, it was really palpable. He said, I'm really tired of having people like me called a fuzzy-headed idealist. He said, who are the fuzzy-headed people? Wars are silly, they're destructive, uh, and uh, we can't have any more of them, yet the people who promote them are called realists, and the people like me and a lot of others who say that our big problems are nuclear weapons and climate change are called idealists. He said, we have to turn that on its head, which is what you're trying to do. Thank you. Sorry.